you imagine life without electronic displays? I definitely cannot. I use my computer every day and I bring my phone everywhere. We stare at electronic screens up to 10 hours per day for work or pleasure. <clears throat> and thanks to the internet and wireless communication, we can access almost any information anytime. And it's the display that shows it to us. But there are also some problems. So <clears throat> inside this display, you find small lamps that send out light. And usually they do that very well. You see what is on the display. But have you tried to bring your computer outside on a sunny day? You know you don't see anything on the display, right? If you use your phone, you can probably still see something, but the small lamps inside, they have to work even harder to overcome the intensity from the ambient light and the sun. So they consume a lot of power. And also, many people experience that it's not comfortable to read on electronic screens. It hurts the eyes. And actually, the light that they emit can influence our sleeping habits. So what if we can make another type of display, a display that simply reflects the light from the environment, just like when we see any other object. So this is called electronic paper, because the surface of the display looks like printed paper. Electronic paper can give you almost zero power consumption. You just need a little bit of energy to change the image to be displayed. And it looks great in bright conditions. But the question is, of course, what should we have inside such a display? It must be some kind of magic material, right? It must be possible to change color, almost like a chameleon or something. And the electronic paper actually exists. This is the most known version. It's the Kindle Reader from Amazon. I have one with me here today. If you have one of these devices, you know the battery lasts for a very long time. So it's designed to show black text on a white background. Very nice for reading books electronically. And if you take it outside, the text looks even better. There is no sun in here, but I can use a strong lamp. And if you shine light on the Kindle, it just looks even better. You see everything more clearly. If I do the same thing with my phone, you can try this at home. You will not see much on the phone display. You just see the lamp instead. So this is a really great device, but there is one problem, and I think you see it. It's only in black and white. It cannot show colorful pictures. We want to see colorful pictures, right? They are pretty. And also, color is a great way for communicating and for sending out information, for drawing attention to certain things, and so on. So I want to make electronic paper in color. And actually, a lot of other scientists want to do that as well. And everybody has failed so far. Why will I succeed? Well, <laughs> at, least, at least I have a unique approach to this. And actually, you've already heard a little bit about it before. I want to use nanostructures in metals to create colors. So you know what a metal is, and from the first speaker, you have heard now what nano is all about, right? So this becomes more like a test now. Here I will show you some nano items from everyday life. Inside the phone, there is a nano SIM card, right? This is the iPod nano music player. <laughs> All right, so let's see. Are these devices really nano scale? No, of course not. Good, you passed the test. Excellent. <laughs> so you know, <clears throat> nano is smaller than what you can see, even in a microscope. Nano is smaller than micro smaller than the cells in our bodies. A virus particle, as we heard, is on the nanoscale. And it turns out that when you structure metals on the nanoscale, you find really nice colors. So this is actually not a very new thing at all. This is a famous example of a glass cup from the Roman Empire. As you can see, it's either really nicely green or nicely red. Depends on if the light comes from outside or inside the cup. Um, and archaeologists, they found this cup and they investigated it, and they looked inside the glass, and they found these tiny, tiny particles of different metals. And these are the particles that give rise to the colors. Of course, the Romans had no idea what they were doing. They just mixed some metals into the glass, and sometimes they got nice colors. They probably, 
had to try many, many times. But today, we know exactly how it works, how the colors arise. This cup is now at the British Museum in London. And uh, when I was there, of course, I had to go and look at it. <laughs> it was really hard to find, actually. So this was like a quest for the Holy Grail for me. <laughs> and, of course, you find the same type of stained glass inside old church windows, like this one from the cathedral in Notre Dame. And these windows, they also prove that the colors are stable for a very long time because you know these windows come from the Middle Ages. They still look, look really nice. So when we make our nanostructures, we use slightly more modern techniques, I guess you can say. We can make any color you want. Here are some samples. Here we have made a red sample, red surface. Here we have made a green surface. And we can make, of course, structures that are also blue, like this one. And then I have a sample which is a little bit more special. This one contains many colors. Um, and this sample is made by silver and gold. So now you're thinking it must be really expensive, right? But actually the amount of gold on this sample is worth less than one euro. This is because the material is very, very thin. And because it's so thin, it's also flexible. So we can make electronic paper which is bendable. So these structures are really colorful, and to make them show something interesting, like an image, we pattern them into small pixels. This is what it can look like. Red, green, and blue pixels. It's the same number of red, green, and blue pixels, but they have different size. So, can you see what this shows? Oh, of course you can't, because you're looking too close. You shouldn't see the individual pixels. What if I make this smaller? Can you see what it is now? It's also a connection to a previous speaker here. It's an eye, yeah? It's the eye of this girl, so here is the complete sample that we made. We've also made famous paintings. I think Picasso was mentioned. Here is our Picasso. This is the weeping woman, the original, and our reproduction. As you can see, they are really, really similar. This one to the left is ink on paper. It will fade with time. Our structure will be stable forever. <laughs> and of course, I had to go look at this painting in reality as well. <laughs> <laughs> so, we know that these structures, when patterned into pixels, can be used to show color images really nicely. But that's not everything. These are static images. We need a way to switch the colors on and off, right? In a display. So how can we do that? Well, the way we do it is that we take our structures and then we cover them with a really, really thin layer of a special kind of plastic. This plastic actually conducts electricity. And when you run an electrical current through the plastic, you can switch it from being transparent or black. And in this way, you can switch the colors on and off. And as you have seen, Red, green, and blue is enough to create all other colors. For instance, if you use red and blue, you get purple. In the same way, switch off one, the blue one, red and green gives you yellow. And of course, switch off red, blue and green gives you cyan. What happens when all of them are on? Well, you get exactly this, white. So, we know this works, we have shown that it works, but we cannot yet control each small pixel individually, electronically. That is the last step that we need to solve, to have a fully working electronic paper in color. So it will be very comfortable to look at, it will look great in sunlight, but the best thing, I think, is that the power consumption will be essentially zero. So I hope that the electronic paper can make a contribution to a sustainable society. Thank you.